But once again, if you have a Bible, we're in Titus, the last chapter. Three, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 15. It's all about disputes and uh, foolishness. I don't know how I got stuck with these last few verses, <laughs> but here we are. La last week, uh, we heard the exhortation that said, remind them, remind them of what to do, who we are, and what God's done. And now the Apostle Paul closes out this letter to Titus. He calls him his son in the faith with some final exhortations, some things that he says, Titus, here's some things you should steer clear of, you should avoid. And I think we should avoid as well. Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 3 of the book of Titus. It says, avoid foolish disputes. Genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. He says, Titus, I want you to steer clear of these disputes. He uses the word foolish. It could be also questions. Foolish disputes and questions. Like you'll hear people sometimes say things like, well, can God, because he's almighty, make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? And you go, who cares? <laughs> That's a foolish question. The, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they, they, they came up with all kinds of things like this. Maybe you'll remember this story. This is a foolish, foolish thing to do. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up an offspring for his name. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died. He did not leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So seven of them had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, this is a question about the resurrection. They didn't believe in it. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be for all seven had her as a wife. First of all, you'd want to say, well, the number three through seven were the foolish ones. <laughs> like, I would check the falafels if I were you. Like, <laughs> what's going on there? But, but it's a foolish question. And it's those kind of things. It's like you, they would argue stuff like, do angels keep the Sabbath? And they would wrangle back and forth about that kind of stuff. And Paul is telling Titus, don't, don't get caught in these disputes and these foolish questions. Uh, 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 avoid, well, he says there again, he says, avoid them. And also when it comes to not only just questions and things like that, but genealogies. And people were into that in the Jewish faith, your lineage, your, your background, things like, well, I came from a priestly line, or, or I'm from the tribe of Judah, or the tribe of Benjamin, and they were convinced that they were a little more special, a little more spiritual, if they came from some kind of priestly or kingly lineage. But Paul, Paul would say a lot about that in his understanding of of. He knew, he knew what it was like to be of a certain lineage. In fact, in the book of Philippians, he told those readers something very important. In, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And that was a confidence in the flesh to, to look back to your genealogy. He said, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence, I more so. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things are gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yes, I, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as, and he says, as garbage or as rubbish, that I might be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law or genealogy or what I, how I kept it, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul says, hey, if you want to brag about genealogies, I could. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I, I, I'm from the tribe that produced the first king of Israel. I have amazing religious background, pedigree. But he says it means nothing. Gaining Christ is what matters. Steer, steer clear of this, this sense of prominence through fleshly pride and status. And then, then he goes on, and, and Paul just really bears down on this whole thing with, with Titus because this is happening within the church. They're trying to enforce the, the Jewish law, and there, there's all kinds of divisions that are starting to crop up. He says, avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, and contentions. Contentions. People who like to argue about everything who like to create debates about everything. Like, like some people just like to complain about everything. Don't look at your husband or your wife at this point. <laughs> people complain about the air conditioning, the carpet, the sound, the parking, the leadership, the rapture, strivings about the law, certain things you can and can't do on the Sabbath. You know, Sabbath was a day of rest, so they had certain laws and regulations that allowed you to rest. You couldn't work on the Sabbath, and they had all kinds of things that they came up with that created work. Like, let's say, for instance, any kind of burden that you would bear, a weight that you would carry around would be breaking the Sabbath. If you had a wooden leg... Can you wear that wooden leg on the Sabbath? I mean, it's not part of your normal, you weren't born that way, so if you're dragging that leg around, you're working on the Sabbath. If you had false teeth, you'd be gumming on, on Sabbath. <laughs> it's not original equipment. If the, if the ground was dusty and you spat upon it, and well, you would make mud, and making mud is work, so you couldn't spit on the ground on the Sabbath. <laughs> All these rules, and, and, and God and his heart and his love for people got lost in this silly minutia. And so he's, he's warning Titus, stay away from that kind of stuff. It's, it's unprofitable. It's It's useless. And it can happen. I mean, I don't know how many of you, how many of you remember uh, Y2K? When the whole world stopped. Remember, remember that? So, so I was actually here pastoring the church during Y2K, and there was quite a group of people who would come to me, and they wanted to talk about this thing. They wanted to wrangle about it. And, and they were trying to force me to do certain things, like, like John, you need to help people uh, know how to turn their pool water into drinking water. Oh. And, and, and you, you, you need to make sure that, that you know, you, you help them prepare how to get kits of food that they can store and be ready. And, and we should prepare up here at the church. We could use these rooms for, for people to stay in when the power goes down and everything shuts down. And, and we could get a group of guys who could fish out in the sound and we could create places around here where we could cook fish and we could help people survive what's going to happen when Y2K occurs. 
And I met with a bunch of them in my office one time, and, and we're sitting there, and they're going through all the stuff that I should be doing. And, and I said, well, let me, let me, let me ask you a question. Where, where in the Bible does it say that I, as the pastor, should create fear and uncertainty about something that we have no idea what really is going to happen? False expectations based on conjecture. And they got really angry. And I brought in a pastor friend of mine from uh, Las Vegas who, who used to work on mainframe computers. He was, he was a brilliant guy. And he spoke on a Wednesday night, and we publicized it. We're going to talk about Y2K from the Bible. And one of the things he said was, I was a mainframe computer expert. He goes, we built them. They didn't build us. And he goes, and we can fix them if we need to fix them. And he goes, if anything at all happens, it'll be very minimal. And as he began to, I saw several guys just get up and walk out. It's like, we, it's like they wanted this to happen or something. And, and it, it, it was, uh, some of that also happened. Some of you will remember the, uh, the whole COVID pandemic. Anybody remember that? We, we, we started back, you know, fairly soon after things shut down, and we, I would get all kinds of emails about people watching online. People are sitting too close. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, we, we, we kept most of us, you know, six feet apart, family sit together, lots of, you know, I wish I would have had some stock and hand sanitizer back then, but it was crazy. Strivings about the law, they are unprofitable and useless, he says. This is an amazing, really, passage of Scripture. And, and he says, For they unprofitable and useless reject the divisive man after the first and second admonition. So you go to them once. They started a, a, a divisive thing. You go to them twice. They kept it up. You go to them the third time. And he says there's a way to deal with that. You know, in, in spite of what we're looking at here, in light of our culture today, I, I would say many Christians sometimes have lost their theological backbone. Listen to what it says. Reject a device of man after first and second admonition, knowing that such a person, verse 11, is warped and sinning and being self-condemned. There's this sense of standing up for truth and dealing with real issues. That's what he's talking about. And, and the reason it doesn't happen a lot in our culture today is there's not a lot of solid Bible teaching in the context of dealing with difficult passages that address ungodly and sinful lifestyles and attitudes. A lot of moral compromise. There's a desire within the Christian community today to, to, to please everyone, to not offend anybody. So standards get lowered and, and even dismissed. I, and, 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 and listen, I'm not talking about being cruel or mean or harsh, but speaking the truth. You're, you're almost like in a situation these days where, oh, don't talk about that. Why? If you talk about it in love. I mean, it's like, oh, you can't mention LBGTQ, WXYZ in your church. Why? Don't talk about immoral sex, sex outside of marriage, because people want to do that. The Bible says not to. Don't talk about drunkenness. People like to drink. In a text like this, it uses terms avoid, reject, exhort. I'm not saying be mean, be harsh, be cruel, but speak the truth, right? I mean, speak it in love. So, so the list here again is foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, striving about the law. This stuff is unprofitable and useless, and it doesn't produce anything. 
And, and the word avoid means uh, to turn your back to, not, not to listen to it. Don't get all trapped in the foolish, unprofitable discussions. Reject the divisive after first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and being self-condemned. Now, the word divisive is an interesting word. It, it, it means heretic or, or sect. That's kind of where it comes from, like people who want to divide into little groups, opposing groups. Heretic means one with bad doctrine or theology, and they cause division. He says, reject, avoid, leave out, because they continue doing it. They, they create disunity. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it, it tells us, If a man is overtaken in any trespasses, you or her spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So you go to them in a gentle way and try to, you know, find out what's going on, and, and you're loving and you're redemptive. But after the first or second admonition, you, you sit down and try and instruct and, and challenge and change and admonish, and someone's into some crazy unbalanced doctrine or action. I like the way one pastor I heard said it this way, their passion has become a distraction to everybody else. And they're unwilling to listen. Go explain how it's divisive and how it's unbalanced. They may agree, and that's great. But sometimes they just keep it up. So again, you hear about it, you hear about it again, you wait another time, and three strikes, it says you're out. L let me give you an illustration. This is a real illustration. Several, many years ago, we had a women's Bible study that was meeting, and um, these two ladies started attending, and uh, they were enjoying the Bible study, but as the study was going on, uh, they began to express things that were out of balance, not according to Scripture, not biblical, outside of God's will for someone's life. They, they began to identify themselves as lesbian lovers. Now, when they first came in, they didn't mention that. And they became very adamant about it, very strong about it, and believed that Scripture supported it. And talked to him once and says, you know, you're welcome here, but you can't promote that agenda or, or say that it's biblical because it's not. Well, they continued saying that, no, it's approved lifestyle in the Scripture. So, so I had to finally myself contact them, and I didn't want to. Who wants to do fight against two women who, you know, are pretty strong? So I'm on the phone, and we're talking, and this one lady said, are you saying that we're not welcome at your church? They didn't attend church here. They just came to the women's Bible study. And I said, no, I'm saying you can't promote the doctrine of that same-sex relationships are approved by God. That's all I'm saying. And that lifestyle should be accepted and permissible according to Scripture. And they got really uptight about it. And they, they, they left. Paul would say in, in, in the book of Romans, let me just read this for you. Chapter 16. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own belly by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So Titus is dealing with a lot of this stuff that's coming at him as the church is being established there in Crete. And there's scripture dealing with people who are false doctrine teachers, not harshly, not, not cruelly, but lovingly, redemptively. But there's a place to draw the line. 
And restoration is the goal. It's, it's like Paul said uh, to the elders in Ephesus in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 20. For I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And Paul had to deal with it. People not harshly, but lovingly. There's always people who want to make it about them, not about Jesus. And, and the body of Christ is his bride, his people. And there are what the scripture calls wolves who like to come in. Paul says here in, in, in Titus, as he's dealing with this and, and uh, this whole situation that's beginning to crop up in the churches in Crete, he says in, in verse 11, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and self-condemned. Warp, twisted in their thinking, he says. They're sinning, being self-condemned. Now, why are they sinning? Well, the church. Listen, is this amazing, phenomenal work of God's grace that brings us together from all backgrounds, all races, all financial status, north, south, east, west, all types of likes and dislikes, God makes us a family, and the Lord has his only son die for our sins that we can be connected to one another, have the same Savior, the same salvation, the same Heavenly Father, the ability to walk and serve the Lord together. And there are those who come in, listen, who want to destroy the unity of the body of Christ. And I just want to read a, a psalm for you. This is a beautiful psalm. I'm sure you've heard it before. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says it's like precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. He says how good and how pleasant it is to dwell in unity. See, not everything good is pleasant, right? A root canal is a good thing. It's not that pleasant. I've had one. Open heart surgery is a good thing, but it's not that pleasant. Widening Highway 98 is a good thing, I think, but it's not been that pleasant. And not everything pleasant is good. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but you pay the price. There is something, however, that's good and pleasant, and the Bible says it's for us to dwell together in unity. And that's what's happening in, in, in Crete, the, the disunity of people coming in, wrangling about things and trying to enforce Jewish law. And, 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 and Acts, it talks about being of one accord, and, and that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And in, in the Old Testament, believe it or not, uh, this is the only place where that word unity, the way it's defined, is used. And how good and pleasant it is for us to dwell together in unity. It's an act of consecration and commitment. It's refreshing. It's renewing. And God brings blessing and unity. It just, he just does. In the New Testament, chapter 4 of Ephesians, we have the word used twice. And it's the only place it's used in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep, you work at it, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he goes on in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, 
to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, unity is implied all throughout the Bible, but it's only mentioned a couple of times the actual word. Read John 17, where Jesus has that amazing prayer, God, Father, they might be one as you and I are one, certainly speaking about unity. So when someone in the body has their own agenda and begins to create disunity and share unsound, divisive words, it says here in Titus that they're warped and they're sinning and they're self condemned because the Holy Spirit is all about making us one. That's what he's about, about creating unity, not disunity, loving one another, making us part of one another's life. A divisive person, he says, admonish him once and then admonish him twice. And if, only, and if unwilling to listen, then just don't include them in the conversation. And, and he gives this, this final e- exhortation in, in verse 12. When I send Artemis to you, Articius, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, which was west of Greece where Titus was there on the island of Crete, for I've decided to spend winter there. Send Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Now, Artemis, we don't have any information about him in Scripture. Don't know who he really is. He's only mentioned this one time. But he's trusted by Paul. Tychius, he's mentioned in Acts and Ephesians, Colossians, Timothy, here in Titus. So, so Paul says, when one of these arrives, you come to Nicopolis, for I'm spending the winter there. And at this time, I, I want you to kind of understand the context. Rome is persecuting Christians. Nero's in charge. Israel is under siege by Titus Vespasian, surrounded the capital city of Jerusalem. This is not a good time for believers in Christ in that culture and in that day. But Paul's not giving up, even though the world is in chaos. And he's telling Titus this, listen. He says, don't leave. Don't leave Crete until someone qualified comes to be in that role that you're in. Tychius or Artemis to lead and serve the church there in Crete. Don't bail. And he goes on in verse 13 and says, send Zenos the lawyer. Zenos is a, is a Roman name. And it's the only lawyer in the Bible that was a Christian. Now, I'm not implying anything, but th- that's the only one you ever hear of. Not trying to make a point, it's just an observation. It's a Roman name, and and perhaps Paul wants to question about Roman law because he's running into all kinds of things where he's going to be tried and arrested. So he says, hey, uh, Zenos would be profitable. Difficult times legally in Roman cities. And let our people, verse 14, learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. This is the ninth time out of all 46 verses in the book of Titus that he mentions good works. It's one of the main themes of this letter, the book of Titus, that we believers, those in Crete, would be about good works, not the law, not tradition, not rituals, not religions, not unprofitable debates and questions, but good works, meeting real needs and and being fruitful. That's what God's after in your life and mine. Not a bunch of religious stuff, but bearing fruit for the kingdom. And part of that is taking care of these missionaries, Zenos and and Apollos, to help them in their ministry. We're, We're all called to be fruitful, to be involved in meeting the needs of others in the church, in our community, And for the loss, to to continue to grow and bear fruit. 
The, the final verse, verse 15, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. All who are with me greet you, Titus. Now, it's not like, he, like today where if you wanted to say, hey, all, all of us greet you and you all get together and you, you know, take a selfie. They, they, they didn't have that. There's no FaceTime. There's no Zoom calls. So Titus finally gets this letter. By the time it gets there, he says, Titus, we're all with you, man. We all greet you. We're here for you. We, we're praying for you, Titus. Titus, we're standing with you. And he says, uh, grace be, be with you all. He, he ends with grace. And the last thing Crete will hear from Paul as he finishes this letter is grace be with you all. Grace has appeared, as it said in verse uh, of chapter 2. You know, grace has appeared to all men. We, we went over that passage of Scripture. In verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus, it's all because of his grace that we're new creations. Titus, it's all because of grace that you're there in the island of Crete. Grace, as we've seen in verse 12 of chapter 2, teaches us to deny ungodliness Things we say no to now in our lives because God's grace has changed us, changed our hearts. Grace teaches us to look forward to his coming, looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking forward to his coming. Now, this was a new thing in that day and that time to look forward to the coming of, of Christ. I don't know if you knew when Isaiah saw the Lord. Remember what Isaiah said? I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And what did he do? He said, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Normally when someone would see the Lord or have a vision of him, immediately they would be fearful. Daniel, the most righteous man in Babylon, the Lord appeared and he said, all my beauty turned to ashes and I fell on my face before him. Grace causes us to look forward to his appearing. John on the island of Patmos, the apostle, one who Jesus loved, when he, the Lord appeared to him, he said, I fell down like a dead man. But that's not how we respond. I have a, a three-year-old granddaughter who's cuter than any grandchildren you have. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. She walked out of her bedroom the other day. I wasn't there, but she walked out of her bedroom with two Bibles. And she said to her dad, Dad, Jesus is coming back. And he's got a horse. <laughs> I don't know. He's coming back. And we don't have to be afraid. Now, there was a time when people would, oh, my gosh, God's going to reveal himself and Daniel and Isaiah and John the Apostle. But what could cause us to look forward to the coming of Christ and all his glory and power and his majesty? What could cause that? His grace. Now we know his grace. Paul signs off and to, the, to Titus and the Cretans and the Coastlinians, and he says, grace be with you all. Let's keep the unity. Let's keep the good works. Let's avoid foolish disputes and reject divisiveness. People, people who want to, who will not listen to a loving challenge. Titus, raise up qualified leaders. That's what the book's about. And teach sound doctrine. Be zealous for good works. Embrace God's grace. See, if you just have church attendance or religious views, and you've never experienced the grace and forgiveness and the power of that in your life, then you've missed it. It's about his grace. I mean, you know the old hymn, grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Religion versus relationship. God's grace. God speaks by his word. 
And, and you can know for certain that you've experienced his grace, that you've been forgiven by his grace. And you can be new in Christ. You can look forward. You can know for sure and not have to fear it. Paul wants Titus to warn, teach sound doctrine, be involved in good works. Jesus gave all kinds of warnings. And Paul has given some warnings here to Titus. Remember, remember Jesus gave warnings about false teachers. Jesus gave warnings about the truth versus that which is untrue. They said, the truth will set you free. The truth of the gospel. He says, don't, don't lay up treasures here on earth where moth and, you know, rust and all that can, but, but lay up your treasures in heaven. He warned us against it. Jesus warned against the wide road that, that leads to destruction. And the narrow road, he said, that leads to life. These are warnings that Jesus gave. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He warned us against it. He said, you can't serve God and money. He also said, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out spirits and perform miracles? And Jesus said, let me warn you, I never knew you if you never experienced my grace. How do you know for sure? The apostle John in one of his epistles said, these things are written that you might know you have eternal life. You don't have to wonder about it. I heard this illustration recently, and we'll close with this. A husband was going to take his wife to dinner for their anniversary. So he selected a fancy, swanky, dress-up, get-ready-to-pay, overpriced food restaurant. You know the kind. We won't mention any names. So he called to make a reservation. And now when you get a reservation, they, they write down your name, they secure the time, the table for your dinner at a certain date and time. So he calls and the person answers, says, I'd like to make a reservation for my wife and I for our anniversary on a certain date. She says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, we're completely booked on that date. You don't have a single table? Nope, not one. Well, what can, is there anything I can do? Well, you can show up and hope. Show up and hope. Yeah, sometimes we have a no-show or a cancellation, and if you're in the waiting area, I could get you in. But, but no guarantee? No. No certainty? No, I'm sorry. So we could get all dressed up, be sitting there, and be turned away? Yeah, that's probably what will happen. So he thought, hmm, I can't imagine telling my wife on our anniversary, let's get all dressed up. So we can sit in a waiting area and hope to get a seat. Happy anniversary. <laughs> no, he, he says, I want a guaranteed seat, a confirmed table, my name on the list. And you know what? A billion times and a billion times more, I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. I don't want to wonder if I get there. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, your name's not here. What? You don't have to just hope you're going to heaven. The Bible says you can know for sure. Christ has done all he can do to give you and I salvation and forgiveness and a place in heaven. He, he, he died on a cross for, for your sins and mine. And someone put it this way one time. When Jesus died on a cross, gave his life so that you and I might be forgiven and have heaven as a home, it's almost like he said, if you want to go to hell then you'll have to walk over my dead body to get there. And people do it. Let me ask you a question. Do you know for certain you're going to heaven? Have you experienced what Paul said to Titus about grace? And have you ever heard the Lord knocking on the door of your heart saying, open the door, let me come in? If you have, you know what that is? That's grace speaking to you. Because he could force his way into anything. He's the God of the universe, but he won't do that. He'll say, if you want me, if you want to be forgiven, if you want my grace in your life, if you want to make a reservation, so to speak, for heaven, 
then open the door and I'll come in and I'll forgive you. And if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new.